Um, so if anyone's sitting in on this conversation, this is the public recording of the very private catch up that James and I are about to have. Uh, I messaged James and I said, bro, we haven't caught up because I'm in New Zealand and he's in Bali. And I was like, this will be cool for us to just record a podcasty type thing. Uh, the really, really, really random all over the place scattered show. And so we each just have stuff to update each other on and we're going to jam on all sorts of stuff and there's no time limit and we have yeah. beverages of choice. It's going to be good. Um, Mine's not, I, everyone thinks I drink IPA when I drink barley rain. Yeah. Yeah. It looks, it looks like you, um, like if you were showing up to on a call and I didn't know you, I'd be like, man, this guy's hardcore, like, yeah. you know, work life integration. He's on it while he's on a call. Smashing the tall boys at, at yeah. 11 o'clock in the morning. So we haven't caught up. So how are you? And how's family and, and how's uh, Bali? I'm good. I am. Um, it's the, cause the Brazilians away. And then, so I've got one, one kid at a time. And so it's kind of weird cause I got all this space and I'm right. like, you know, I create lots of space, but then I've got even more. Right. And then like yesterday, everyone went home, all the staff went home at one. I'm just sitting there and I had nothing in the diary and nothing in the calendar. And I'm like, you know, sunning my balls. And I was like, man, all the space, like, what do you do with it? Yeah. I felt like I should be doing, you know, you know, when you create even more space and then the guilt kicks in of like, I need to do more stuff. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it felt like that for the past kind of few days. Cause everything just feels so easy. It reminds me of um, the quote by Naval where he talks about better bored than busy. And someone messaged me the other day, like a former client who like, we parted so amicably and he's like, bro, I'm going to do the big sales team thing. We're going to hundred K a month and he just want to scale like crazy. And, but he's messaging me with the inevitable, like, but this is really hard and burning out and blah, blah, blah. And he said, so what do you do with all your time that you have when you're not working on the business? I was like, well, obviously I'm married and have kids. So that that's a allotment of time. Hmm. But I said, I'm really okay with being bored. Like boredom isn't the enemy anymore. And in yeah. fact, like, I think that's an, a really underrated strategy to be ultra creative, but it's very yeah. uncomfortable. Like it's, yeah. it's so uncomfortable. Like whenever you feel like there's an hour spare, you feel like, I, at least for me, I'm probably projecting, but there's that sense of like, I need to build, I need to create if I'm not working or thinking about work or reading or going through a course or whatever it is, there's a sense of like your uh, entropy is taking over. You're like going backwards. Um, oh, and I just find that fascinating. I think, I think that's the muscle memory, isn't it? Like, because before when you were doing that, you were procrastinating from something. I, I, again, I'm projecting from me. Like mm -hmm. whenever I had those moments in the past, I was avoiding something rather than just sitting in it. I'm much better with travel now. Mm -hmm. You know, we were, we were in New Zealand the other week and then away over the weekend. And with travel, I used to have that empty guilt feeling like I should be I should be working on something I can't just enjoy this but travel is way more wandery for me now and I'm okay with just wandering and flaneuring around mm. so I've kind of solved the emotional part of that but yeah still when I got tons of time still those those things come up and I'm like How got two good books going yeah just right of stuff to do but it's just yeah the, the space thing is a struggle how much do you think these are lessons that we could have learned day one versus we had to go through the hustle and the grind and the busyness to kind of get to here? Obviously we did in terms of getting to the lessons, but if you yeah. were to pull a, pull a, uh, come alongside a beginner, would you be telling them to create stacks of free time early on? Do you think that's even possible? Do you think it's doable? Like, what do you think your advice would be on that? I, th I think, you, I think you got to grind at the beginning on anything. I right. think, I think you have to, you have to create all these like hardcore for me, you have to create all these hardcore discipline and rules and structure. So you know what you can break later mm. and sure that you can, you can get outside influence that condenses that cycle, but you have to go through one of them. You have to yeah. go through one pain cycle of like all this scattered work and just busy work and not getting any results yeah. to pick out the things to go. Okay. What, well, what did drive the results? Cause like power laws are ridiculous, right? Right. You know, you do 900 things and four of them got you the result, but it's just the, the learning of like, which four was it so that I can keep doing those and then removing everything else. So I don't think you can do it from day one, but you can definitely do it from after, after year one, maybe. It's also about exposure, right? Like I, I'll never forget. Um, 
Have you seen Jiro Dreams of Sushi, the documentary? Yeah, yeah. Where the master sushi chef in Japan makes his apprentices go through like a decade of they're only allowed to touch rice. And then they're, and then the next decade or whatever is like they're only allowed to touch the the worst type type of fish, and then you can work your way up. And part of that just sounds ridiculous to our Western mind. We're like have no no grid for mastery or things like that. But one of the things I remember early on when I was in Consulting Accelerator and just getting started, uh, Sam Ovens Consulting Accelerator. Um, I remember even just playing Xbox for hours at a night and listening to modules I'd already listened to. Because I was like, there was just such a lack of familiarity with like all of these concepts. And I think part of the grind that out phase is like, I think people view it in the wrong way where um, if we were to come alongside a beginner and say like, you need to grind it out, it's almost like a earning your stripes, but it's really not that. It's like exposure and familiarity with concepts and ideas and repetition. Uh, it's like when you do powerlifting or Olympic lifting, highly technical moves, you have to move no weight on the bar for a lot of reps before you can move a lot of weight on the bar for a few reps. And I think it's a lot of that, like that kind of, this is where the bar feels on your body. It's like, this is how it feels when a good idea strikes and you write it and copy. And this is how um, it feels when a client is, is a prospect is about to say yes, but there's an objection in front of it. And I think it's less about the, you need to develop work ethic and go really hard and more about you need to get familiar with all the different uh, stimuluses and see the pat like pattern recognition as well, you know? Definitely. Do you think it's got something to do with pain tolerance as well? Because my, the observable thing for me is that some people have such a high pain tolerance that they just can keep on grinding forever and they don't know any other yeah, I mean, this is this is such a funny conversation because it's like so, there's so much nuance. Like one of the things I was thinking about today was that's um, why it needs a conversation, right? <laughs> I saw yeah, I saw a post, and it was like I don't trust fat people because they're undisciplined, and yeah. I'm overweight, so I'm like I can 100 percent resonate. I'm like I'm still working on stuff uh, that is causing me to be overweight. So when I'm thinner, I would have figured out some stuff but also one of the things i was reflecting on was like but i'm ultra disciplined in other areas of my life yeah so it's like really interesting where it's i i think there are skill sets and there's pain tolerance but then it's about can you apply the necessary characteristics and skills in the right business direction because you can have like this is one of the things that blows my mind is that um people in the fitness space for example are incredibly disciplined when it comes to like their body but then you tell them to post content every day and they're like, oh my gosh, it's just, but it's not a discipline. Like it's not just discipline. You can't just say they're undisciplined. They haven't developed that uh, relationship with the work where discipline allows them to do what is necessary. And so whether it's a vision problem or a, a lack of clarity around how to do it, but I find it really interesting because it's not as, I don't think it's as absolute as they need to develop a pain tolerance. It's like you need to develop a certain type of pain tolerance or a certain type of discipline in this yeah. area of work. Yeah. The the thing that comes for me there is like the the, the gym example, right? Right. People go, oh, I'm really disciplined with my fitness. So therefore I should be disciplined in this other area. Mm -hmm. But the other factor is enjoyment. Right. Like yes. you and I, you and I enjoy business. Mm. We geek out on stuff. We talk about stuff. We like, we enjoy it. So we do things that we enjoy and we do more of them. Whereas, so applying discipline to something you enjoy is not so much necessary, not as much less necessary. Whereas in other areas of your life, you may not enjoy things as much. So you, you, but you know, they're good for you. So you mm -hmm. have to apply discipline to them. So then how much discipline do you feel like you have to exert in your business right now? Like, do you still perceive it as discipline? Just to, just to not do stuff and not interfere with shit. Yeah, yeah. So it's less about the <laughs> discipline to post or the discipline to create a piece of content for your clients or something. No, that stuff's easy because I right. love it. And, and even the discipline, like not to over-engineer or not to over-deliver or not to over-interfere. Mm -hmm. that's the discipline that I'm working on because right. I'm trying to remove my ego from helping because we are we're in the business of helping people, right? And we help ourselves and then we help other people. Mm. But if I over engineer things, I kind of get in the way of their flow because I'm like adding all this stuff in the way of them to try and serve them. 
but yeah. it's not valuable because it kind of gets in their way. So that's yeah, why yeah, I'm yeah. trying to apply discipline of like trying to understand like when do I need to insert myself into this thing that's called a business and this thing that's called a client and when do I just need to stay the hell away from it and just let it flow because they're in flow? Yeah. And I, I, one of the things that you said, what are we going to talk about? One of the things that um, there's been this like purple patch for about the last two months of client results. And one What's of the purple pieces, patch? Just ridiculously good. Right? Oh, right. And one of the things that's come up for me is that this like insecurity around it because I've never done so little to help people get such amazing results. Mm -hmm. and like i feel like insecure about it like oh did they need me in the first place like what was going on here but one of the things i've consciously engineered is like give people the next two steps whereas for quite a while i was like this is the plan and this is the sequences and these are the things you need to go but then like the old mike tyson quote as soon as you know you've got a plan and you get punched in the mouth it all falls apart that was yeah. happening and the, when the certainty was taken away they're like what do we do next and yeah. so like coming back to the, like the question is like the discipline was like just giving them the, th trying to give them the things they need and letting them go in their way and not being insecure because they weren't coming to every call and checking in on the community. Right. Yeah, they, yeah. Had, they had the simple, tiny, tiny, tiny little nudges and, and perspectives and nuances from me. And then they were kind of going off doing it. So it's like yeah. trying not to over engineer and over interfere in things and just simplify things once for people and then kind of get out of the way. It's actually a really funny um, topic, eh? Because it's it's funny how we understand good marketing is like having a dream outcome, and then we so because it's about focus, right? Mm. And then people come into our world, and then we struggle with helping them stay focused, and even us helping them stay, uh, us being focused on the right parts of their journey. And like an example would be, I had a client that I reach out, and they're like, clients are getting amazing results. Mm. And everything's going amazing, but they're not engaging with the community. And my like Slack channel was dead. Like, what do I do? Yeah. And yeah. it's really funny. It's like, well, is this a problem to solve? Because are you selling yeah. a relationship? Like, was the was the reason people join? You're about to get a bunch of friends. It's going to be incredible. <laughs> or was it to make money? Because if it's to make money, you're actually doing your job. And yes, you can tweak things and blah blah blah. But is this a problem to solve? And I think the discipline to not do things is probably, you're exactly right. That's how I experience business as well. I got a DM yesterday from someone I've been getting to know they're at four or 5 million a year. And they were like, had a business opportunity for me. They're like, bro, you know, I didn't even, I, to be honest, I didn't even read all the Instagram DMs. It was like 15 Instagram DMs. And all I saw was like, you know, I'll just send it a few, do a few posts and emails will be 50, 50 or whatever. And I was like, Hey man, um, uh, actually, let me read it out because I think it was like a funny um, example uh, because this is what most people crave, but most people don't know how to do it. Uh, this guy messaged me. I won't name him, um, but he seems like a lovely guy. And his message was around some business opportunity we do 50-50. And I said, thanks for thinking of me, dude, but I'm really good. I'm ironically not mo money motivated at all. And I just like to keep my business really fun and simple, which means extreme focus and saying no to basically everything. This is the guy that pitched me. And he replies back, not a problem at all, man. I love every word that comes out of your mouth. Lol, you speak my language. And so it's like people want focus more than ever. And that's the thing they aspire to, but their decisions mm. and their behaviors say the exact opposite. So it's mm. like, here's what I want. But the thing that I keep creating in myself is distraction. And I think you're exactly right. It's like, it requires no discipline for me to keep doing what I'm doing. It's so fun. Um, but the discipline comes in making sure that I don't screw it up or I don't lead the clients in the wrong direction, or I don't let my insecurity drive the business. Yeah, or over-engineer stuff. Like I've struggled yeah. between the transition from the, the scale period that I was in to the growth period where I have to, you know. Talk, and us, make, talk us through that. I mean, there's just me here, but for anyone who might be listening to our conversation, growth versus scale, what are those differences? So a few years ago, I learned this distinction from a, from a mentor in terms of that focus piece. Mm -hmm. that there's two kind of, we'll call them seasons for, for use because they're variable in how they operate and they're variable in like how long they go for. But scale was, I launched something, it was really successful and it was good and people interacted with it. So all I had to do was add more people. I didn't have to right. do anything new, launch new stuff, didn't have to make it complex. I just had to find people to go into to, to, to sell the product to. And then when you kind of reach the end of the, okay, I've, offered it to everyone in my audience multiple times. I've had different ways of offering it. 
and you see the decline that start to go down, you need to go, okay, well, I've still got this audience and I've still got its customer base. I need to tap into new bits of value inside it so I can turn what, so I launched a new program, a lower tier thing to go into. And mm-hmm. then I got, I got 74 people who didn't buy the, the syndicate, the main thing to go into the new thing. So mm-hmm. I added something in the, in the grow season, which is like requires some level of innovation and some level of new. And then once those things are better down, you can then scale them again by just putting more people in yep. and doing them. So scale is like growing something that already exists and mm-hmm. growth is when you have to find new things or innovate to actually, you know, find more things that yeah, don't exist sense, yet and then scale them up. Yeah. So what season of business are you in? Like, what does that look like and feel like? So I've gone from scale to growth mm-hmm. and like it's super challenging because the there's new things in there. So it's got more complex, mm. both in the delivery, but it's also got more complex in the marketing too, mm-hmm. because when now I've got a lower ticket thing, it's attracted, got some people who are at lower levels of revenue than the people who join the syndicate or work with me privately. Mm-hmm. So then the messaging starts to subtly change and you're like, and the last few weeks I was like, oh shit, I'm talking to multiple avatars. Like, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The, 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 you know, the cardinal sin of, of kind of marketing of like, oh my God, I'm talking to all these people. So I've just gone through in the last couple of weeks to try and tidy up the message to say, this is who you become. This is the mechanism and rather talk to like where people are now, they're at 5k a month or 10k a month or a hundred or a million, just talk mm. to the transformation and the things that happen. Yeah. And so it's, I think it's useful to know what season you're in, whether you just like, because people want focus, but sometimes they focus so intently on the thing and saying, I've only doing one thing and scale it, that they end up running against that brick wall of like supply and demand. And they actually just need to start innovating yeah. and offering new things. Yeah, so yeah. it's really hard to identify when you are in it. And it was hard to identify um, what mistakes I was making because I was like, this feels hard. Like the messaging yeah. felt hard. So as soon as, so it's just tidying those things up so I can go back into a scale of like, people come here, people come here and yeah, then yeah, they yeah. just get different levels of access. I always love catching up with you because I it's always a reminder like, how differently we think as well. Yeah. Like you think so much more deeply about business than I think I do. Like, I think I'm like a, this, a simpleton in a lot of ways. Hmm. Like I'm more like, like, you know, that meme um, where it's like the bell curve of like the, we, we what is it? The dumb wit, the midwit and the thing, you know, like, and yeah, the yeah. thing I was thinking about today was like um, the dumb person says, follow your heart. And the kind of enlightened person says, follow your heart. And they mean slightly different things, but it's the same truth. Yeah. It's almost like, um, I feel like I am less inclined to even think through the strategies of business, which is, which is probably, it's not good or bad, but I would say there's definitely negative sides to it. And I'm much more feely and intuitive and more like, like as I saw today, I haven't posted or sent an email or whatever in a couple of weeks. Didn't even think about it. I've just been like in different countries and like going with the flow. Um, But what I love about catching up with you is I I remember how much of a method and a strategy there, at least there can be with all this stuff. Um, It's it's funny because they both lead to the same point. Yeah. In a way. Well, and that's, I think one of the things that's really interesting, I know we both have really diverse client bases, but like I was chatting to a client today because they were obsessing over competitors. They were like, oh man, I'm, we're saying this, literally this is what they said. I'm saying this in ads, it's working, but I'm worried because it sounds like everybody else. Hmm. And I said, your goal is to make something effective, not to be ultra creative for the sake of being creative, unless that is your goal, right? But it sounds to me like your goal is to get clients. And I was like walking through this example, I was like, you know, this is guy James, and we literally share a fence in Bali and we're best mates and we have almost the exact same business model and we teach so many similar things. But I said, because we're different, we naturally attract different people. Like within the people that the few hundred people we've both attracted into our worlds in the last year, there's definitely overlap where like there have been a couple of times where you've seen a client join our community and you're like, oh yeah, that client was with me and whatever. Um, and vice versa. 
but um there's so there's such differences because we're so di such different people there's an there's an age difference a stage difference uh way of thinking and yeah. i think it's like such an underrated like thing that i i think a lot of people don't appreciate which is the nuances of your personality determine your market and determine the types of people you work with like you're uh much more insight based than i am like a lot of my yeah. coaching is uh like someone's like I should like, I, I'm wondering if I should do this, this, or this, what do you think I should do? And my question back is like, what do you think you should do? And yeah. obviously I, I still share through what I would, what I would do and how I'd think about it. But like, I think it's just so interesting um, because there is no one size fits all. Like you have to be wicked smart and think through a system and um, be a business genius. Like I listen to some um, podcasts and I'm like, man, you guys are infinitely like, even I listen to Hormozy. I'm like, man, oh, my brain will never work like your brain or Sam Ovens. It's like yeah. never like that. But then I like listen to Taki and I'm like, well, he's doing awesome and he's not like that either. So it's like, there's a real beautiful thing of like, there's just so much room in the market for so many different ways of looking at it. So how did you, because my observation of you is like, you got over that comparison thing quicker than most do. Like, how do you, how have you embraced that? Because obviously you, you're, we're honoring the fact that we're completely different, but the same. <laughs> yeah. Hun yeah. hundred percent. Some people get so stuck there. Like, you, you, you know, your client example of that comparison. Oh my God. I think God, a lot I'm of it has to do with stress. Stuff. I think it's really hard to do that when you're stressed. You know, like for example, if I was making just enough to break even and then like, so for example, a real example is um, someone's in, a, in my DMs and this has happened, I think once or twice. Yeah. And they're like, I'm thinking about working with you or James Kemp. And my answer both times would be like, definitely work with James. Like, mm. I only want to work with people who want to work with me. And so if you're mm. like, go work with James. That sounds amazing. They, got, they, they must be so confused because that's exactly what I say when they do Right, that yeah, yeah. Me. But but it be the same like, person. They're like, it's a, it's a nice luxury to not need that client. Yes. And so the more, and it's not just a function of money either, because you can be rich and still be scared and scarce and all of that. So it's not, it's not just a function of money, but I think the more uh, comfortable I got on my own skin and the less I was in a high stress state, the more I was able to see business for what it really is, which is a beautiful single player game where there's no, like, there's no comparison. Or if there is, you will always lose. There's always someone richer. Mm -hmm. There's always someone who's more successful. And I tried my hand at trying to be Sam Ovens. I'll never forget releasing uh, my first course, Six Figure Side Hustle. And I I tried to do the perfect uh, like kind of screen recordings. So no video, it was all slides. And I remember trying to get the audio perfect because I was like, oh, courses have to be immaculate. I'd just gone through Sam's, it was amazing. So I was in a wooden, like wooden floor house in Sydney. So everything echoed. So I locked myself in a closet and covered my head in pillows and had the microphone in front of me and it was like, hello everyone, Dan Bolton here. Welcome to module, you know, the road ahead. How many, you know, how many, how many takes did you do to get it perfect? So many. And then it would be it's so funny because I was overheating in this closet, literally going, <gasps> and so, and what you need to do, I was like struggling to breathe. But so what's funny is I, the only model I had in courses was Sam. So I was like, oh, this is how courses are done. And then I joined Taki's program in uh, 2018 and I was like, oh my gosh, I love Taki. So then I right away bought an iPad and now every call was like me trying to draw stuff despite my brain not thinking like that. Yeah, yeah, I, my iPad somewhere around here. Um, <laughs> literally just like uh, going through and trying to just replicate all Taki's um, teachings. E even my first ebook was just a ripoff of Taki's mm -hmm. IP. I didn't even understand IP. Then I... Um, started learning from Hormozy and Layla and basically was just trying to be them. And so yeah. Hormozy was like, do the boring work, get up at 4 a.m. And so that was me in like 2020 where I was like getting up at 4 a.m. and on sales call huddles and things like that. My point in all of that is I went through trying to be everyone else yeah. until I realized it was really hard. And the only answer was to just figure out how to be myself. And so it was through pain, exposure to a lot of pain of going, there is only one Dan Bolton and I don't really know who he is right now because I'm so clouded with trying to be someone else. But if I can figure out who Dan Bolton is and double down on that, I have a feeling everything's going to get easier. And so the power for me over the last 18 months, especially is going like, I'm not everyone's person. I'm not everyone's mentor. Not everyone's going to vibe with me. Yeah. And I always think over this um, Tim Ferriss quote where he says, 
uh, your job with a product is not to get everyone to like it, but to get a few, a few people to love it and do it over and over again. Sure. And so I think about myself as the product and going like, not everyone's going to like Dan, but if I can show up fully and authentically, then a few people are going to love me. And if I just can see you show up authentically consistently, then I'll just continue to accrue a bunch of people who love me and, or, or feel connected, feel that sense of, um, that sense of affinity. And I think when you realize there is so much opportunity and that there is no lack of people who need your help. Um, even when you kind of go into the depths of like your calling on earth purpose, that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's the thing that really uh, makes me feel so relaxed about this. Even like I was talking to today, I know I'm going on a rant right now, but I'll, I'll land the plane shortly, James. Um, <laughs> I was talking to someone today and I was like, you know, the problem with uh, being an artist is when you try when you combine artistry with entrepreneurship and you, instead of trying to make the best music, you try and make the most well-liked music by the most people, or you create an album, but then you have a, a set number of albums that you want to sell. The best music finds its audience. And so your job is to create the best art you possibly can. And I very much see business as a canvas for art. And I actually can't control how many people resonate with that art. I can't, and, and the moment I stopped trying to control it, everything got easier. Cause I was like, well, I'm not going to, I'm like, even now I don't set client goals. I don't have amount of revenue I'm trying to make. Even up until six months ago, I was still trying to do that. And I just gave up. I was like, this is useless. Like I can't control whether I get eight clients this month or 10 clients this month. I can do the activities and hopefully move towards that number, but I can't control it. I'm not going to coerce people and manipulate people. So when I took my foot off the gas, so to speak, or more so took my hands off the steering wheel of trying to completely control everything. I started realizing I'm competing against no one, right? I'm literally just trying to create art and, oh my gosh, these reactions just kill me. Wait, wait, wait what's this one? Is it is it this one? No, there we go. Oh my God. Amazing. I don't know how to get rid of any of those. Um, but when I realized that my job was to do my best work and help as many people as, as I could, and that was the win, not how much money I made, not how many clients I signed. Ironically, I started signing more clients and making more money because I think people sensed the lack of desperation in me. Sure. That when someone's in my DMs and they're like, like even now it's, the community's closed and they're like, oh, can you send me over the info? And I just say like, no, I'll let you know when it opens. Yeah. The role has reversed so dramatically that people are almost taken aback. They're like, what? You, like you're not trying to sell me? Someone asked me the other day, they said, uh, they asked me four questions. Uh, number one, um, can you please break down your exact method for getting clients and how it's different to X, Y, Z? Number two, you mentioned you get people to this revenue level. Do you offer a guarantee around that? Number three, what time zones are your calls? And number four, can't remember. And I just responded back and said, hey man, I don't think it's a right fit, but all the best. And he was yeah, like, exactly. and then he started talking to himself. Like, yeah, he was like, oh, <laughs> he's like, oh, no, no. I mean like, you know, but again, that there's something so powerful about not needing anything from everyone. And that, is all interconnected with like, I'm not trying to compete against anyone. I don't need clients. I'm not desperate for anyone's attention. And that was just a slow ego death over the last 18 months of going like, the more I step into this, like I'm trying to compete with people and I'm trying to get a bigger business than last year and all that. It's just such uh it can be such dark energy. And so I know there's a very long winded answer because it's a kind of a convoluted journey of like not one moment, but lots of moments. But I but think, I think like you've, you've hit on something like, cause all of that resonates with me, but we're currently making six figures plus a month profit each, mm -hmm. right? We don't really, we've solved our primary scarcity needs, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of what, how the world judges them financial and we're comfortable and got good relationships and the kids are healthy and, and those things. How do people because this is like, this is a sticky one because removing that need and desperation is the key <laughs> to like creating space for people to be attracted to you mm -hmm. because not needing anything like the world ain't fair. It flows, <laughs> the demand flows to the people who need it the most. Can people cultivate that with while actually in scarcity? Like it's all very well for us to say like, just let go of need and, you know, turn oh, up and service. 100%. And, yeah. I'm it's, always trying to catch well, myself. hard to say to like, someone who's got like, they've given you their last thousand dollars and they've got, you know, bills to pay next Thursday and go, just let go, bro. It will be fine. So 
my two cents on this is firstly, that's so true. And I'm completely guilty of it. And I'm always trying to catch myself going, am I? I'm, I know it's a private conversation, but I'm like, I'm displaying empathy here and setting, setting up the scene because I have, I the, I have the audience. No, 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 no. I completely agree. <laughs> and it's something I think about a lot. Um, it's It's connected to goals for me, right? So all of this is connected to how you try and make progress in general. Because yeah. the irony is that scarcity doesn't go away for rich people either. And I'm not even classing myself in the rich people. I mean, like the people I know that have tens of millions, they can still be just as scarce as the dude trying to pay rent next week. So it yeah, is an energetic sometimes choice. More, right? sometimes oh, more. It's crazy. So what I would say is um, you need to make, you need to pay rent next week, right? So your job is to do everything you can to position yourself in such a way that you are going to have the best shot at getting clients and paying rent next week. Hmm. The mistake becomes when you go from that macro goal down to a micro connection with someone, and then you try and make that person you're in conversation with the one that's going to pay your rent next week. Yeah. Nice. Right. So nice. it's when you're in conversation and all of a sudden you're like, okay, you have to solve this problem for me because I'm broke and I have an offer and you need to buy it. The, the metaphorical people, reaching into their pocket. They're, you're reaching for their wallet, right? Well, yeah. For, in, in sales world, they call this commission breath, right? <laughs> and so for me, there's something so powerful and challenging and beautiful about being detached from the outcome of uh, sales conversations and, uh, specifically, right? Yeah. Because we're talking about how do you have good energy when you are in scarcity in reality, right? And firstly, I don't think it is just affirmations and meditations. I think that yeah. stuff is very important. And I think, um, again, that's what holds even people with money back from a, feeling that sense of peace is they haven't realigned their identity around this isn't about money in the bank. This is about who I am and all of that. But it's, it's really the ability to stay detached from outcomes on the micro level. Because if you're in a, let's just do an example that everyone will relate to, which is you're in a DM conversation with someone. If you need to make rent next week, pay the bills, pay the set, pay the clothes, whatever you, what have you got going on in your business? And you're now looking at that person you're in conversation with as a dollar sign, that's scarcity, right? Abundance is you going, I'm going to see if I can help this person. And if I can't, I'm not going to try and make them someone I'm going to help and they're going to pay me. I'm going to try and move on to the next opportunity to help someone. And I think it's more, it's so much more about the attitude to the mundane uh, in terms of how you approach that. And one of the things that I was talking to a client about yesterday was um, I posted this on Facebook a few weeks ago, but I elaborated on it yesterday, which is like being energetically attractive is one of the most underrated ways to get clients. And I said to this person, this person's name was uh, Haley. And I said, Haley, a uh, happy, peaceful, low stress Haley is the best business model. Because and what we do, and like this is not true of a paper company, right? I couldn't care less the emotional state of the paper CEO. All I yeah, care about very, is is the paper good, is it cheap, business. all of that. When it comes to coaching, we're inviting people to go deeper into our energy, right? Whether you call it energy, space, proximity, whatever you want to call it. So in marketing and sales, we're giving people a taste of who we are. And if people like what they see and like what they experience, we then invite people to come closer to us in a group format, in a one-to-one -one format, on calls, in Slack. And so if you just like think very literally about this, right? If you perceive someone as being chaotic, stressed out, uh, you know, scarcity mindset, right? They just look at everyone as a number and they're saying, hey, 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 come out with three spots left to come hang out with me more, <laughs> Right. It sounds funny. We don't consciously think about it like this, but the reason uh, we often lose a lot of sales is because the energy people pick up from us. You can replace energy before also emotions, the core emotional state we live out of. It actually repels people because it's simply more of what they've already experienced or are experiencing now. So yeah. someone's in stress and you are also in stress. Basically what you're saying is, hey, would you like to come experience that really horrible situation you're facing right now with me and we can experience it together? And so the more that you can cultivate a sense of calm and peace and low stress, even if you're broke, even if all if the numbers in your bank account aren't lining up, the easier it is to get people to want to give you money because you're inviting them to be around someone whose energy is in a better place often than theirs. The flip side also is the more stressed you are and the more scarce you are, the more likely you are to attract clients exactly in the same state.
because your vibe attracts your tribe. So I would say it's not about how much money you have or don't have. That's a limiting limiting belief factor, whatever it is, because you can have a lot of money, be stressed. You can have not much money, be stressed. It's more about the energy and emotion you're choosing to live out of that determines how people perceive you. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? I know this Honestly, is like we're in like I, I deep think, I think territory right now, but I know I do I do the same thing with people around expectations, right? Both in when I'm selling, um, selling or when I'm messaging, and also with clients. One of the reasons that clients have got such crazy results recently is I've lowered their expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, because we do deadlines, we do scarcity, we open, we only open programs on you know certain on a, on a, on a rhythm. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm like, how many do you think, how many do you think you can sell to, to the audience? And they're like 10. So let's do three. Right. Right. <laughs> because if leave they, some demand in the market, it, it, well, it, it's, it's got a strategic viewpoint, but it's also got an expectation, which removes the pressure on them. Like mm. you say, with commission breath to get the 10, right. Mm. Cause they, if they have to stretch to get the 10, they're going to be chasing everyone all over the place yeah. because by their own definition 10 is like the par and mm. that's the, the thing that must be achieved when they got three they're like i can take it or leave it i don't yeah. need this particular person there's something here and then well, ironically what one client who was going to open across a across a month and get 10 opened three times on sh short deadlines and got 12 right. but there was so much less stress in each one because she only took three people at a time <laughs> And, the, and so she had that natural energy of people coming into it going, okay, you know, by all accounts, you've actually only got three spots for this. Yeah. And she was saying, is this right for you? Is it the right mm -hmm. timing? And asking questions which were in consideration because the expectations were lower. So yeah. I, you know, the same thing you talk about energy, I also talk around the energy of expectations because people are, if you expect to start working with a coach and get to 100K a month within 30 days, et cetera, like, unless you're a unicorn, you're going to be disappointed. Right. And if you're disappointed, you're not going to take the next action that's required because you're probably, the thing after disappointment is always demoralization if you stay in disappointment <laughs> for long enough. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I think I, I look at it around expectations the same way as like, how can you lower expectations to make that energy available for discernment, for abundance? Because if you make small promises to yourself and keep them, you build that level of self-confidence because yeah. self-confidence is always destroyed when people lie to themselves. Well, I think this is, and I think we can summarize all of this as a pretty complex uh, topic in just you intentionally choosing the emotional state that you were trying to cultivate and then teaching others to do the same. And through modeling, then. through, through, through exactly through, through modeling, modeling, but then also through state, not saying you got to feel like this. No, no, no. Sorry. I'm all mean like even in the way that we market and sell, like for example, it's the person who is creating fake scarcity in their marketing all the time. And yeah. they're wondering why it's not working. It's because they're, they're trying to create a state of stress and fear yeah. and FOMO in their audience. Yeah. yeah. But you, how you market and sell and onboard people is you training them the emotional state that you allow and encourage. It's you get what you tolerate. Right. Yeah. And so I think it's like really interesting. I always come back to that quote by Brooke Castillo. You don't get burnt out by the amount of hours you work, but by the core emotion fueling the work, yeah. the core, core emotion fueling your marketing and sales determine more about the effect of marketing and sales. than it does about how often you post or whether you're doing YouTube or whether you have a open cart, closed cart, all of that is like really, really uh, so much more foundational than the strategy because you can have the right strategy and with the wrong emotional driver, you'll still get poor results. You might even get all the clients you wanted, but they're the wrong clients, totally. right? And that's also where retention gets really easy. When you have a great emotional state of being, people love being around you. And so they'll keep paying to be around you. One of the things I wanted to know was um, what's working for you in business right now? Like we can go through the what's working, what's not working. I've got a list of stuff as well. What's been working yeah. for you, both for you and for clients? I think um, as I've moved into a growth area, like managing the future energy of what my calendar looks like has been essential. So for me, one of the things, because I onboard everybody, pretty much everybody personally, one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. If you're coming into the syndicate, you get a call with me. If you pay 3K, you pay annually, you get a call with me. So I have to manage my energy and manage my calendar a lot. 
So I've been a lot more strict on kind of deadlines of like opening up when I've got capacity to take those calls and and sticking to those deadlines, which means that I've kind of just slowly and perceptibly just grown with limited, you know, I don't have to feel like I have to do a big launch and kind of expand those numbers. It's just set the deadline, stick to it. Three people join, great. If they don't, no worries, just close it off and kind of do it. Mm -hmm. So getting into that rhythm, I think has worked super well for me because that's allowed the creative space to go back into client service. Like every, like I've ramped up the amount of workshops we have inside the group. And like, again, that's ramped up my creative energy. So that yeah. creative energy like spills over into everything. So I think the deadlines helped me manage energy in my calendar, which helped me manage energy that I put into my creation, which helped me manage energy to, to actually like put out in my content creation. So I feel kind of, just having those disciplines just works in terms of getting that flywheel created, mm. especially when life is like kind of complex. Yeah. How, and how many workshops stuff. are you doing at the moment? Like so are you on a two, cadence? Two a month. Yeah. So every second cool. week. Oh, yeah. it's awesome. And so for anyone who's listening and doesn't know, you do them for clients. So stuff you're already going to share and teach yeah. and then you just sell tickets to it. Yeah. And then invite those people to come client. So, and talk us through the like, um, decision to, close your syndicate, your main offer to people who haven't bought one of those cheap things, cheap, cheap things being the low ticket workshops. Yeah. So that was, that was on the side of like one of the things that wasn't working for me as I don't have a central, I don't have a central piece video piece of content that documents my methodology and my way of approaching how to scale a business. Mm -hmm. So I was always asked, I was getting asked by tons of people. I was like, where's your thing? Like you've got a, you've got a video that goes through those yeah, pieces. Yeah. And until the book comes out, which is still a couple of weeks away, I don't have a, hey, go and digest this and go to this place right? and and understand how I think and how I approach scaling businesses. And you can't just say, oh, just watch me for a few weeks and see how it works because there's a need there. So the, the, the lack of that meant that I had like no place to go and say, this is how I think and this is how I do it. And this is what actually happens if you work with me. And that was causing a lot of like congestion and like I was starting to sell to people. I was right. like, yeah, I think I can help you. And I was like, again, it's like not my vibe. Yeah, and so because yeah. I didn't have anything that pre-sells people, I was getting into this kind of jam where I was like having to sell people in and that was having all kinds of like downstream stuff of resentment of like, don't you just get how smart I am and how like, look at my results and look at me. Da, da, da. Yeah, yeah. So it's it was kind of weird where I was like, this anticipation of the book coming out and having this thing where I can send people what at the same time want to kind of to keep adding clients to it, but all at the same time having to, to, to kind of sell to them. So it's a funny place to, it's a funny place to be in, but I've just like navigated my way through it. No, it makes total sense. And I think um that'll be on one of the things that's working well for me in terms of like content that pre-sells. Um, what are the, what are like the areas that you're focused on working on right now? Like what's not, good what's what are the to give to give people context you basically built a multi-million dollar business almost from scratch a year ago yeah. and so it's like easy 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 then you hit like some i mean i would say neither of us have really had massive obstacles in the last year it's more just like yeah. friction like ah this is actually not that fun like i remember both of us sat down at one of our favorite cafes honey a few months ago and we're like we're taking way too many calls like what's going on i think you also came back from a trip and you had like I don't know how, I don't know how many calls you had, but it was stupid. You were like on calls all day, multiple days. So there's momentary things like that, but that's like easy. You just change mm. a few tweaks, but like, what are the things right now that feel like challenges or problems as you kind of go to the next few million? I've done, I've made a big mistake. I see like as a big mistake. It's not, it's not, it's not a one way bet, but I have fragmented the very thing I believe in the most, right. which is the community. And well, all that the was, if anyone heard that, that's just me cranking some San Pellegrino. Sorry, I keep talking. <laughs> I can recommend Bali Rain. When I'm in Bali, I drink that. <laughs> um, <laughs> this was brought to you by San Pelli. Yeah, I've got, I've got a problem because I fragmented the thing that I believe in the most that actually fuels the whole thing, which is the people and the people mm -hmm. interacting with me and the people interacting with each other and harnessing the energy of the group with a shared vision. Mm. And I've made a mistake in fragmenting those and having them into two to two or three 
distinct places where I've kind of dissipated the power of mm. the people that I've got in my world. So, to, so to I'm in the break process it down. of unwinding that. So just to get specific, so you are you talking about the three K code, which is about yeah. people earlier on the journey. There's a school group, community, blah blah. Then you've got the syndicate, which is a school group, and then you've got the inner circle, which is like yeah. Slack and yeah. separate calls and stuff like that. The so you basically the three communities. Sovereign circle work in tandem with each other nicely, but we've got this. We've got a. There's still a community element where people in the circle still participate in the syndicate community, mm -hmm. and there's this they just get more access to me, right? Yep. And we have more intimacy because we have a, a call, a smaller call totally. with less people on it together. So, so what's like, the challenge? That works. The 3K syndicate interaction is like they're in two distinct places. Yeah. But then there's like ascension, like people upgrade from the 3K into the syndicate. Yeah. But then there's no crossover in, in tension and, and, and attention from people who can help each other, which is like one of the greatest things about the positive flywheel of these businesses at scale. Yeah, yeah. Because I I got into that trap of like these people are at this much revenue and these people are at this much revenue, so therefore they're completely different human beings. When yeah. actually there's a ton of my job was actually to create spaces for different spaces for people to have relevant conversations. Mm. But in the process of like siloing them, I've yeah. broken up the most important like flywheel there is, which is the community and the humans inside it. So, so what's I've the, got, got what solutions. Are the possible solutions? I think I've reimagined the way that community, what community is. I used to think community was just school, but we've started right. like a WhatsApp group that was just yeah. all around health and fitness and accountability and those kind of things. And I'm like, okay, the community is way more nuanced than even I can appreciate right now. So it was for the, the community, I've just started to pull apart the idea of a community and the spaces that that clients exist in mm. and more focused on their the experience element rather than going, oh yeah, everybody needs to, everybody's in this school group and that kind of thing. So I'm introducing layers to it, which is cool. like, we're going to use WhatsApp so they can communicate. We Even can between have, 3K and Syndicate? So Syndicate will be WhatsApp, but I, I need to blend the communities back together in school and have one group and then different levels of access to people oh that's bro that sounds before. like my worst nightmare I'm, I'm real interested to see how it goes and i don't mean that in a negative sense it's more like the reason you've separated them in the first place is the like the the fear of like well, we've got this guy getting his first client and this guy getting his you know millionth client and all of that and so there's like challenges and beautiful parts of it so i'm interested to see how you navigate it yeah i'm i've tested some stuff which i'm confident that i can create the right spaces for the right people in different ways yeah, I just got to like, these people are different and therefore these people aren't going to work. We want to, and there's, there's, the problem is there's partial truth to that. But if you're making a million a month, you don't want to be having conversation of like, how do I get my first client? Like mm -hmm. over and over again in those spaces. So to me, it's like creating the spaces for those people in the right places and, and understanding what community and access are. So yeah, I, I yeah. found that with my community calls that the more, newer people i don't do any any beginners right now um that'll be one of the things i've been working on that i'll share um and but one of the things i found is the more people i take on at lower revenue the less the higher revenue people come to the community calls yeah because it's like you, have we you have people spaces for those people elsewhere exactly yeah that's what i'm yeah. that's what i'm exploring yeah. like one of the things that i um and exploring is like joint workshops and things like that. Yeah. So it's like, and, and then connecting maybe a social hour after that or mastermind breakouts. I have no solutions for it, but that's, I'm very much thinking about that. The model I was actually thinking about today was like, Jesus had the masses. He had the 72 and then he had the 12. And then within the 12, he had the three, mm -hmm. Peter, James, and John. And so it's like re relationships naturally have, there is a tribe. Or yeah. there's a village and then there's tribes and then there's families and then there's, you know, husband and wife teams. So it's what we're talking about is human dynamics, which is yeah. just like, it's harder than ever to understand how uh, relational dynamics will naturally happen in the wild because we have cities and cities just make no sense where it's like you have a million people thrown together and then you have neighborhoods and no one knows their neighbors and no one's talking and maybe you have a church group, but it's just all over the place. But like, um, there's a really good book called Tribes uh, by, it's not by Seth Godin. It's by, Seth Godin's one's really good. 
um, it's called Tribes on Homecoming or something like that, but it's the natural. Is it an orange uh, cover? I can't remember. I read it on Kindle. Anyway, just talking about that idea of like tribes are naturally 150 people and then there's yeah, smaller yeah. nucleuses within that. And, you know, having a church background, one of the things that is fascinating about churches is they, a lot of churches don't get this part right, but some of them do, which is the community piece of going the Sunday all in group gathering is one part of it. And that's where of, oftentimes every generation is a part of it, whether the young kids have their own room and, you know, the, the 18 to 75 year olds are all in one gathering. But then if churches do it well, then they have the little pods that meet around the cities and homes and things like that. And so it's finding different gathered and scattered expressions of community. How do we gather everyone together? Man, that those emojis are killing me. <laughs> how do we how do we gather everyone in a way that everyone feels like they're part of something bigger? And then how do we scatter in such a way that everyone uh, feels like they're a part of a smaller tribe where everyone knows their name? And I think that's well, one yeah, of the things I'm that's, really that's exploring. Awesome. That is an awesome frame because that's kind of how I'm thinking about it, where I've consciously, for those reasons, but the <laughs> Can I do, but could I, I, I can't see myself. So um, what's funny is I've not, I've turned this emoji thing off multiple times and it keeps coming back on. I've also turned my waiting room off multiple times and it keeps going back on. <laughs> zoom, zoom on you. <laughs> Just, <laughs> the, uh, I'm so going to keep my, my hands below the table. My circle, my circle was like 12 people. That's it. Yeah. Right. 12 that, disciples. The 12 disciples that they benefit the, the, the value proposition is access and intimacy. Like yeah. there were six people on the call this morning and we had an amazing conversation that you could only really have with six, maybe seven, maybe eight people. Yeah. Right. But that doesn't benefit from scale as we call mm -hmm. it. And the syndicate's a hundred and I'm not going over that. Yeah. But then there's that, you know, the, the three K level in in reality is infinite in terms of how many people I could put into that and how many I added. Like I launched it and it got the same size as the syndicate within a month, right? In terms of like numbers mm -hmm. of, of people. But again, like in that, I need to create that intimacy of those groups because it benefits from scale, but then you have, you have to invert it as well because it benefits from small groups collaborating too. Oh yeah. So it's this like constant big small kind of viewpoint where like okay is this does this benefit from scale in the circles case no i can't i mm. don't want to add more people in i could I've got plenty of demand for it but i'm not doing more than 12 in the syndicates case okay that's a cap that i've chosen and it feels great mm -hmm. but then on the other thing is like okay scale the crap out of this but then you've got to get intimacy into it and it's that the flicking back between and forth those things is like super challenging to create those environments without again, creating complexity for yourself or create or having ways where people get lost because well, that's, you know how they, people solve most leave. of this dude, they just build a team. <laughs> and so all of this becomes simple. If we just decide to pay people to do it and it obviously gets worse and complex in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. But this is what this is the challenge that both of us are having is like, well, how do you do it in a simple way that is basically doable with punished. someone in VA? We're just being punished for being so damn good at selling people <laughs> into us. Yeah, but what's really funny is like this has been an obsession of mine because um one of the most magical parts of my business is the in-person intensives. And so we spend a few days together. It's just amazing. And the connection I have with my clients is insane. And then we all, so we had in Japan, we had uh, 22 of us from nine different countries. And the beauty of that is we're all in one place for three days. And the worst part of that is we all go back to our nine countries after that. And then we have to try and figure out how to keep cultivating relationship and connection until not just until the next intensive, but allowing the next intensive to just be a part of the ongoing relationship rather yeah. than be like, hey guys, we'll pick up where we left off next time. Right. And I think that's the worst part of churches and organizations is when they become Sunday centric. Right. They just are only the gathered expression. I think I'm really obsessively trying to think about the scattered expression because the, the uh, truth is very few coaching programs on the planet do it at all. And of those that tried to do it at all, very few do it well. Mostly it's like a Facebook group and a guru 
and it, it it grows or it doesn't. And the bigger it gets, typically the worse the experience gets. People fall through the cracks. Someone log, doesn't log into the modules or come to a community call in 90 days. No one knows. They're not missed. And then they just simply jump into the next program, hoping that they'll feel a little bit more connected and a little bit more at home and a little bit more amongst their tribe. And then they just go searching from program to program and coach to coach, searching for the experience that no one's given them. Which is care. Mm -hmm. What? Like the thing that I'm number one trying to scale is care. Right. And one of the reasons I'm unprepared to hire coaches, even though I've got a couple of clients running calls for me in the 3K, is because... I don't want to build layers between me and my clients. I want to mm -hmm. have as minimal layers as yeah. possible. The coach that does no things. coaching, which is the model for most people. Well, I'm not really in this to run a business, right? Yeah. You know, if I wanted to be a businessman, I've been a businessman before, then I'd hire people and you have the, all the bits that come with it. Yeah. But this is like a creative cash flow pursuit. <laughs> yeah. For me. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I, I do not, you know, I understand the trade-off, but I just do not want to hire layers between me yeah. and the, 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 the people and delegate care. I could. 100%. Some people do it really well. Yeah. But I don't know. No, let's be honest. I'd say most you? people don't. Most people don't join a program to work with some guy called John or some girl called Sarah who they've never met. That the, that the close is telling them is amazing. I think like the experience that most people have is like they would much rather work with the person, but because the person is available, they settle for this other like situation. Yeah. And there are a handful of uh, situations. Oh, we'll give props where, where credit is due. We're like, I joined Cole Gordon's program in 2020. And I, I got, I mean, he, Cole was really helpful to me personally, but I had an account manager. That was an amazing experience, but I've been in, a dozen masterminds and programs and never had an experience like that. That's mm. the exception, not the rule. The rule is like you get some person who's like nowhere near as skilled as the person you want to work with. And um, they kind of know the modules and whatever else. I think it's a very, very broken model for a reason because it's very hard to not just scale care, but scale expertise, right? If the person that you wanted to work Chinese with- whispers down the track. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you get the main guy telling, saying one thing in the module and then the assistant coach telling you to do something else and it doesn't work. Um, but, it, but that's why I think this is so elegant about around what we do, which is that like people fall in love with us or, or whatever you want to call it, feel attracted to work with us, know, like, and trust in our marketing. And then the, the value proposition is, would you like to come work with me personally, <laughs> either yeah. in a group? group environment or in a one-to-one -one environment. And that's why I think it's so easy to convert people because there's no bait and switch. It's just like, Hey, yeah. if you vibe yeah. with me on YouTube, you might, will probably vibe being on a call with me. Yeah. Right. So who coaches me? <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, hey, just, just what, what comes up here as well. Cause um, I don't know if you've read it, but um, Eli, Eli gold, is it gold frap or gold rat? The, the theories of constraints kind of business guru right mm -hmm. is that in oh hold on a minute one second this is too funny it's on the bookshelf here i am pretending i don't know who we're talking about eli yahoo gold rat gold rat yeah <laughs> a process of ongoing improvement i just thought it was so funny because i thought i literally had no idea what you're talking about but yeah. by the way when i was curious this is apparently the uh the Bible of Mr. Beast's business. So this is why I bought it is because it's all about process and theory of constraints. Yeah. And so that's how they scaled their production company was learning all this stuff. Yeah. Anyway, so I interrupted that you. That stuff's amazing if you want to grow a business because in that it talks about the theory of constraints, which is like finding the constraint to grow and then mm -hmm. fixing it, right? Right. The, the thing that Rick, like reading his stuff again, because it's the choices. I think the choice is a different book to the goal is more accessible for a lot of people in terms of converting it into like practical ideas in our world. Um, that we choose the constraints up front. <laughs> and then we work through like some of, we work through the trade-offs on those constraints of yeah. going, okay, well, I've set the rules that it's going to be me. I'm just going to have a hundred people in the, yeah. whereas the theory of constraints is like, how do we get from a hundred to 500 
Like, yeah. how do we break through this? But, but like that scale mentality of like, we just add people or we add automation or we add, and sometimes that is the answer for us. And like with yeah. AI, I guess it will be more of the answer. Yeah. But the thing that strikes me with like our stuff is that we set the rules up front. It's like, it's just going to be me. You might hire some people to do that, that and that. But you'll always talk to me. I'll always be there on these on these roles. And we kind of, yeah. we do it up front. Yeah. And it's a completely different way of approaching business. Yeah. Because it's not really approaching business. <laughs> no, no, I get it. it it's it, like having a life and then putting constraints around it and then going, okay, how do I operate? Because all I care about is like, how do I operate the best I possibly can on Tuesday and Thursday mornings? Yeah. Because that's when you do calls. That's when I do calls. That's when yeah. I do work. The trade-offs conversation is fascinating, eh? I was... um. I just uh, got a new one-to-one -one client a few weeks ago. Amazing guy. He was at um, 1.5 million a month about three or four months ago and is in the process of burning it all to the ground as, as it often <laughs> happens. And he said, um, story. he just said, I'm sick of managing people because I have absolutely no desire to. <laughs> and yeah. um, it, it was funny because I, I had an ex-client who's an amazing human reach out a few days ago and he said, man, uh, I was offering these, these calls on my stories. And I don't know if you saw that where I was like out on a walk. Oh, yeah, I, I saw that. Like, I saw that. Um, I was out on a walk and I was like, whoever's free. By the way, that was really fun. I I highly recommend anyone who is struggling to get clients, take the sales hat off for a second and just actually try to help people. Because on those Instagram stories, basically the story was I was out for a walk. I'm in New Zealand. So there's footpaths everywhere, unlike Bali. And so I'm really racking up my steps. And I'm sick of basically all content at the moment. And I'm sick of listening to, I don't want to watch a YouTube video, blah, blah. So I'm out on these walks and I've got time. And so I posted on my stories. I said, you know, if, if you're around and uh, want some help, uh, DM me and we will chat. And literally on those calls, there's literally nothing for sale. I'm not telling someone to go download an ebook or send me a message. I, I'll say DM me, oh, this is my WhatsApp and I'm a text me. And uh, then we'll jump on and we chat for sometimes seven minutes, sometimes 12 minutes. I just say, what's your biggest problem? Anyway, amazing conversations. Highly recommend just making yourself available to your audience like that if you're struggling to gain momentum. And um, one of these, these ex-clients, exactly. One of these ex-clients <laughs> reaches out and he says, bro, I keep missing you on these walk and talks, but I really need your help. Um, I won't say the market, but but he was like, you know, I'm selling, actually I will say the market because I'm just not saying his name. He said, I'm selling uh, I, I, I'm really struggling in business. I can't figure out a way to consistently get clients. And this is a guy that when he was working with me, he was doing 30, 40, $50,000 a month. And I just messaged him and I said, Hey man, do you still want to be selling uh, weight loss? And he's like, uh, no, nah, I'm really over it. And I said, cool. So getting clients is real easy when you really love the clients you're working with and the work you're doing. So rather than trying to get a new strategy to get clients, how about you just change your offer and figure out some people you do want to work with? And he said, but I've built this market over all these years. I feel so stupid walking mm. away. And I was like, sweet, then keep doing it. <laughs> like, like for me, it was so simple. It was like, you yeah, either yeah, yeah, keep yeah. the market that you have and have a business you don't like because you were like, you have the belief that it's sunk cost, whatever, <laughs> or you find a new market that you do like, and then you have to rebuild it from scratch. But one yeah. of the things that I think is just so confronting to people is steering trade-offs in the face. I know. Right. Like one of the phrases that, that people use with me all the time is like, I don't want to leave money on the table. And I'm like, you if you do your life right, you will spend your whole life leaving money on the table. You have to get really yeah. comfortable with it because I'm leaving money on the table all the time by not selling on sales calls or by not having yeah. a sitter or by not running more ads or We're not replying those to are you Yeah, <laughs> not replying to my dude. I haven't uploaded a YouTube video in like don't three even months. See most of the sales. <laughs> Dude, and so it's just hilarious because I'm really comfortable. I know you are as well with trade-offs. I'm super okay with not being at 10 times the size. Someone could offer me literally a billion dollars today and say, Dan, all you have to do for the next five years is work 60 hours a week uh, being, on a, being, on, being a closer. And for me, it'd be the easiest no of my life. I'd be like, I might, I might unalive myself like before the end of those five years. Like, that, you know... It's just such an easy no that that trade-off is like already predetermined. And I think one of the things that is so key for people is to figure out their convictions. And one of the things I've realized that people mistake their convictions for is conveniences, right? So people have conveniences and they believe those to be convictions. So a convenience for me is selling via DMs, right? If I had, if my family required me 
to make enough money to go jump on sales calls again. I thought sales calls was the best answer. You would see me flying my calendar around the internet like no one's business, right? Because that's a convenience that I absolutely love to live with, right? But when it comes to trade-offs, I'm really clear on my convictions. Like uh, some really good friends and mentors of mine, Ewan McManus and Aaron McManus, 65 year old dad. I think he's 65. Aaron's 35. They're best friends. They run a podcast together. They hang out every day. They text all day. They're legit like best friends. For me, I look at that and go, I so deeply want even a fraction of that with my boys. Therefore, I'm willing to prioritize time with them now so that I can have that amazing life one day when they're adults. What that means is a ton of trade-offs that I'm completely okay with making because the vision of what I want is greater than the temptation of things I actually don't want that all that much. Yeah. And what's yeah. really funny is like when it comes to team, um, someone's like, oh man, Dan, I'm so sorry. I'm going to hire a closer. And like, as if it's like confessions, you know, cause like, I'm yeah, like, yeah. I'm, oh, I'm so sorry, guy. James, I'm going to get on a sales call. I'm like, oh, <laughs> And for me, I'm like, if that's a trade-off you're willing to make, I am so for you doing that. What yeah, I don't yeah, want yeah. you to do is blindly think that's the only way to sell because that's what you were taught all along. And the trade-offs conversation is really uncomfortable for people because it requires them to think for themselves and answer a question for themselves that no one else can answer on their behalf right? I can't tell you what you should do with your life. I can't tell you what your convictions are. I can't tell you what is the right path. All I can say is this is what's working for me. Based on what you're facing, this is what I would do. What do you think you should do? And it's just such a level of empowerment and responsibility that most people just aren't used to. Like having to actually go, I'm going to choose this, which means I'm not going to choose this. But, but it's where all the power is mm. because that's asking people for the first time in their lives, what they actually want and actually getting them to follow through on that vision, even if it's, you know, vague or even slightly flawed in the beginning is where the power is because it's theirs. Mm. And getting people to step into that is like where all the power is because, and it's also the thing they desire, which is to be unique and be seen for that and, and running, you know, running their own race. But the uncomfortable bit is that every decision has a trade-off. And this is, that's what I think wisdom is like wisdom is understanding the consequences of your decisions. Right. <laughs> it's like going, 100%. if I do this, then that happens and that happens. Yeah. But if you're unprepared for, if you're unprepared to be accountable for the, the neck, the perceived negative trade-off of your decision, yeah, you're probably just going to build stress on stress. Yeah. You know, because you'll either get trapped in the idea or you're going to make a decision that actually gets you deeper into the the painful place you're already in. Yeah, hundred percent. I want to share a few things working for me, and then some things what, that working, I've been struggling Dan? with. So, no surprise for anyone who follows me. Um, despite not uploading for YouTube in the last ninety days, which is hilarious on its own, because people would think I've fallen off the wagon, uh, and all I've fallen off the wagon of is the content review wagon. So there's like 25 videos there ready to go. And there's been really important lessons. Like um, talking about like one of the most underrated parts of at least the way I see business is running experiments. I ran an experiment um, because I had myself and a content manager and content was really simple. And I was like, I want to scale content. I want to be on all the platforms, not out of just more out of fun than anything. I was like, if I can figure out how to do this um, in a way that's simple enough for me, uh, I'm sure it'll mean more clients and more impact and all of that. And so uh, we ran a 60 day experiment with a team of three. And I remember talking th this through with you. I was like, bro, I've just hired three content people. We'll see if it goes well. And they were all amazing individuals because we screened like crazy. We had a thumbnail editor and a copywriter that was helping with like YouTube headlines and repurposing my transcripts, like basically taking videos like this and then making them into an email or something like that. And then a video editor. And basically, as soon as they started, I went dark on the process because now they were, I needed to review all this stuff. I, if Managing. someone was, if some, yeah, exactly, if someone was <laughs> writing copy, I now had to look at it. And so, anyway, this is going somewhere. So, we ended that experiment. Amazing humans. If anyone's looking for a copyright thumbnail editor, uh, video editor, come hit me up because got some amazing people there who I would probably love work. Um, but it was a really interesting lesson. But even after not uploading for the last 90 days, 
I still get inbound leads every single day from yeah. YouTube in general, and then one one video in particular. So my YouTube strategy has been really simple. I modeled Iman Gadzi, who's someone I've known for years, and he's one of the smartest people on YouTube. Um, and he basically has a, a strategy where he uploads videos and he, his is way more nuanced than me. He's like going for growth and reaching your audiences, but basically he doesn't sell in any of his videos except for one. Now, recently he started breaking out of this because he does like live three day things, but for years, all he did was, uh, lots of different videos that then in the description linked to one video that was the sales video. Right. So I adopted this and kind of came up with this like idea of the mini VSL, which is basically just a VSL that's shorter than most. And in that I go like, here's who Dan is. Here's like my unique model and mechanism. And if you want to find out more about this thing called the community that I started, I talk about it for like two minutes. I say, send me a DM on Facebook or Instagram. And so I've uploaded 60 YouTube videos in just over the last year. And all yeah. of those are getting like, I'm, still getting hundreds and hundreds of hours of watch time every month, just off the kind of longevity of these videos. And then all of them, literally not one single video has a call to action in it for anything. No send me message, no download the thing. They all just have the link to the mini VSL in the description. And so it's been crazy to me because it's obviously not passive income, but it's the most passive like lead generation source I've yeah. ever had. Yeah. Literally every day I'll wake up to more people messaging about just the keyword community. And all it is, is YouTube doing its thing. And so I'm so excited to just do YouTube more seriously. And I've, I've leaned everything up where it's just going to be me and a video editor. And I'm going to live with the fact that the thumbnails are going to be average and the YouTube titles will be thrown together. And I don't care. I just want to put something out there yeah. because the power of video specifically in terms of allowing people to get to know you is just absolutely unmatched. So yeah. I was just going to mention that because I think that's been a really, really interesting thing for me. And if I have any regrets in business, one of them would be not taking that seriously sooner. Yeah. Um, so that long, the the VSL, is that coming up in um, the recommendations as well? Or is it is it unlisted? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure people are finding it's on their own. It's got They're like 4,000 views or something like that. It's, uh, you know, how I make 80 to 100K a month with, one funnel or two at four hours, four hours a day, something like that. I can't remember what it is, but um, it's basically just going through my model. And so, yeah, that'd be recommended, but um, it's also hyperlinked. It's also the thing that when I send out an email, I'll say something like PS, if you don't, if you're newer to my world and don't really know much about me, check this video out. So it's yeah. the thing that if I was doing sales calls, it's the video I'd make people watch before a sales call. And either it'd be the thing that yeah, generated the, the call, pre-sale video. Yeah. yeah. And it's a huge, it's a huge unlock in actually pre-selling um, prospects because uh, oh, yeah. re really quickly. So like Aristotle says that there's three levels to persuasion. You just went Ethos, from YouTube pathos, to and logos. What was that? You just went from YouTube to Aristotle. That's I know. So there's three sales that, that need to be made, right? Three, like three levels of persuasion, three sales that need to be made. Three yeses you need to get. A yes yeah. on you, a yes on your method, a yes on your offer, right? And so when you have a sales call, that has none of the three yeses, then people are going to ask you, what makes you so special, right? Why should I choose you over X, Y, Z? And then the second question you're going to have is, how do I know this is going to work for me, right? Oh, this is all well and good. Your method is great, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then the third is like price, terms, when are the calls, all that kind of stuff. And so pre-selling prospects in my experience now is if you can get them sold on you and get them sold on your method, then the offer becomes the easiest sale. Yeah. And so people go, oh, how do I sell on the DMs? You have the first two sales in marketing. So the only sale that needs to be, oh my, you're killing me, Zoom. Because um, the, then the only sale that needs to be made in the DMs is on the offer. Because I'll never yeah. sell to anyone in the DMs who's like, I don't know if you're the right guy. I'm like, cool, I'm definitely not, right? Yeah. <laughs> go yeah. go explore, go whatever. If someone's like, I don't know if this will work for me, I go, cool, absolutely no worries. I'm waiting for those two first sales to be made before the offer sale is to be made. 100%. Anyway, Linking to offer, I just want to quickly touch on this and then we can jam, is this idea of a tiered offer. I think you teach something similar, but I kind of stumbled on this where I launched one-to-one -one first. Yeah. I got that to 30 people uh, really soon after I launched it last year. And then I opened a community in June of last year, which was basically the same group calls, the same content, 
uh, the same school community, but with no one-to-one -to, -one to me. And yeah. so all up now, I think I'm at 85 clients and I'll cap that out at a at hundred. But one of the things that was really interesting to me is I used to have separate docs for everything and all of that. Or what I would do is I would go back and forth. So I'd be like, oh, I'm going to fill some one-to-one -one spots this week. And then I'm, oh, I'm going to fill some community spots. What I did was I just put it on the same doc, yeah. right? Because 80% yeah. of the offers are the same. The one to So community people get the content, group coaching and community. And the one-to-one -one people just get one-to-one -one with me. So same content, same group coaching, same community. I know you know this, but what's really interesting is I literally just put it on the same doc and it was really fascinating the way that people who were just coming in for info in the community would ascend into one-to-one -one. Mm. and then vice versa. People who were coming into one-to-one -one were uh, going, you know, this isn't the right fit or it's too expensive or whatever, and then uh, going into community. And it increased my conversion dramatically. And it really changed the way that I saw this whole belief around one offer to 1 million. Yeah. I was like, I think the answer these days could be one tiered offer to 1 million, which yeah. means it's one offer that has two tiers of access. And that's been a really interesting development for me because I've been so rigorous in my recommendation of like, don't have a down sell, don't have an upsell, just have one offer. And then I kind of stumbled upon this like one offer with two tiers of access where I'm like, oh, this is like a glitch in the matrix where it's like, because one of the things that will happen for me is on a retention side, I'll have someone at one-to-one -one for six or nine months. And then rather than leave me, they just go into the community. But that's, and then that's I'll have people the in the community thing. that that's go the, the other way. Thing. Yeah. That's the thing that I've, that I've, you know, and I, I teach and do exactly the same thing. The thing that's hidden as well is that your overall churn drops massively. Oh yeah. Because you actually, it's like 60% of people downgrade rather than leave as they yeah. come out of the, 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 the higher tier thing or the, or the longer term thing. Yeah. So you, you reduce your overall churn massively because churn is going to happen, but rather than leaving, they can find their level. But that, but also the other thing that is happening for me, and I don't know if this is happening for you, is if you offer to upgrade people for certain periods of time, people start to plan you into their schedule. I'm going to work with Dan one-on-one -on -one for 10 weeks because yeah. at that time I'm going to be in growth mode and, see, and, I'll, and I'll benefit from that. And then they're going to go back to the community level. Yeah. So you actually build in flexibility, which is way more natural for clients. So mm -hmm. it's killer. And it kills the really stupid front end, back end model of our industry, which is like you have two programs, they have different curriculums, different communities, and it's this constant spinning plates thing. It is the simplest thing in the world. So when I launched it, it was just there's content, group coaching, community, and then one to one people got two 30 minute calls with me a month. And that was the only difference. Now I've moved everything onto Slack so that I don't do any calls. But the the proximity piece is so simple and so like deceptively effective that it just has yeah. blown my mind. And then the the latest development was putting it all on one doc and letting yeah. people choose their own adventure. And when I just said, here's the community, and then I gave them the doc and then says community or one-to-one -one mentorship and they can choose, conversions went way up. And I was like, wow, I don't know why I didn't do this sooner. And so since we've been teaching clients that it's been crushing. That this is the you know my I, my vulnerability about my mistake before I I teach this yet I went away from that and had two communities right yeah so the biggest mistake I I I have made is not following my own advice yeah in terms of because I've fragmented that and one of the descriptions I say to people is like if you want to guru yourself you are selling levels of access right yeah do you want just the community level do you want community and calls or do you want community and calls and Slack or you know, the the levels are the same rather than changing the the front and back you change you're selling different transformations or different outcomes yeah you're just selling how much access do you want we're going to do the same method but well, and that's also the other stupid thing about front end and back ends for different people with different goals and uh we had that i don't know if you ever did that i mean did you ever do front end back end thing back in the day yeah oh definitely yeah well yeah, that was like one of the first mistakes like 6800 right. up front Two grand a month if you want the if you want the other thing. Yeah, I did that. I remember when I killed that in start of twenty twenty two, and I just made one awesome thing instead of two average things, <laughs> and I was like, "This is so much better." And like retention went up. The whole frame I had around that time was like, uh, you know, Homozi offer so good, you feel stupid saying no. I was like, "How do you make an offer so good people would feel stupid to leave?" And I realized that was really hard to answer for two offers, <laughs> so I just tried to make one.
Um, but this has been a huge unlock. The thing that I enjoy about it the most, and one of the reasons I realized that I'd made a mistake with my structure, is I love making something and then just putting it there so people can access it. Yeah. Like I love the fact that I just make a workshop or some new training or some like thing that's going to get someone a result. And I don't have to think about which clients is this for? Oh, okay. It so this goes... is what I'm about to create for myself though. So let me talk you through this new launch. Okay. You can coach me. You can coach my dumbness. So uh, by the way, if you hit, if you hit one second, I'm looking at it, my son who's got a haircut and different hair color. Is he? Which one? And the Eli, one or the big one. Eli's yeah. like devastated. His hair looks great, but it somehow looks different color. So hopefully they put like fun colors in it or something. Um, just give me a moment. I'm just going to close my door. Are they are they temporary? Are they? This is the mystery. What's happened to Dan's children? I don't know. This is the beauty of like working from home. I mean, right now I'm technically not at home. I'm in New Zealand. Um, but <laughs> anyway, I just saw a, a used to be blonde, now dark haired boy that we definitely didn't die as here, but something <laughs> I'm hoping very it's just too. very blonde. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm launching this thing and you know, I've been <laughs> emojis. Um, you know, I've been going back and forth on this for a while and like, what's really, what is really hard to comprehend and not, it, it'll sound very egotistical when I say it, but like, it is hard for people to imagine that at some point you're not doing things for money. Like if mm. I just wanted more money, I would just work with richer people. <laughs> like I would, I would just keep ratcheting up the community and keep making it more expensive. The idea of like working with people earlier on in the journey uh, is really hard. It's really hard. And, and so the idea of like, um, making my life simpler and just making more money is like, I just keep working with higher ends of the market, you know? But yeah. one of the things that I know you and I have both talked about that we both feel a huge, I don't know if responsibility is the right word, but really like a, an opportunity to do is to figure out how do we help Dan and James from 10 years ago, the people who mm -hmm. were just starting out, who were like, had all the problems, had all the challenges, had the dreams and none of the roadmap. And so I've been trying to brainstorm this, um, this thing because, you know, uh, frankly, like we're both expensive and working with us is real expensive. And I mean, trying to dream up this kind of accessible, really effective uh, experiment of a membership. And I say experiment because if it sucks for me or it sucks for the people that come in, I'll kill it because I don't need it. Yeah. And I'm super happy to do that. Anyway, so in brainstorming this thing called Modern Autonomy, and we have 750 people on the wait list, I have got 150, maybe 170 feedback forms filled out. So we, one of the smartest things, I'll quickly break this down for anyone who's thinking about launching or relaunching offers is I said, I'm working on something. This isn't a pitch, no link to buy. But if you'd like to review what I'm working on as an offer to see if this would be helpful for you, then like DM me 10K or whatever it was. And uh, hundreds of people DM me and then 150 yeah. people filled out a feedback form. And the feedback form was like, after reading this doc, do you like out of 10, do you, how many, like what number do you feel like uh confidence level you are in terms of whether this could help you get to 10 to 20 K a month? The next one was, uh, what do you feel like is missing? Third one was, would you buy it? Fourth one was, you know, any comments. So it's been overwhelmingly positive. Like I yeah. think we could launch it tomorrow and get a hundred people in the first week and hundreds if I push it really hard. The challenge though, and I'm, I thought we could just jam on this for a second if that's cool. So here's what I'm thinking. Uh, roadmap, that's pretty straightforward. Do this, then do this, then do this. And the thing that I've really differentiated uh, in terms of the two communities is modern autonomy is going to be about teaching a system. I yeah. do not want to teach people how to think. If you're at 1K a month, I want you to do exactly what I tell you to do and you will yeah. make money. Yeah. If you're at 30K a month and you're in the community, I want you to stop following the rules and I want you to start like going, here's like, here's a system, find what works for you. Right. So, so it's almost like, like step one, follow the blueprint, step two, follow your heart, whatever. Yeah. So what, what I'm thinking about and what I've mapped out is I have some amazing people in my world that are really good friends and contractors and amazing coaches in their own right. And basically I'll just bring them on for a portion of time and there'll be a roadmap and then there'll be guides within the community. So they'll own areas of mindset and setting and sales and content and offer development. And so for 
for 297 a month, we'll have probably five support calls a week. Um, again, not run by me, run by amazing, amazing people that are really skilled at what they do. And then we're also thinking about having one-to-one -one coaches mm -hmm. and the one-to-one -one coaches job will be, uh, keeping track of you, making sure that you're touching base and momentum. And sometimes they'll point you to a module. If your question is really straightforward, sometimes it's like, let's get on a group call and jam it out. And sometimes it'll be like, if you need it, we'll jump on a one-to-one -one call and we'll figure it out. And they'll basically be air traffic controllers, not there to teach you stuff because it's yep. going to be in the modules or in the group program, Diagnosis. but they'll be there to support you and making sure that you're not overthinking, you're clear and in momentum. So yep. as far as I know, dude, it'll be the best value low ticket membership on the planet to a yeah. degree, right? It's like, I, I don't know of anyone else that's doing this. The numbers I think work, I think it would still make sense. Um, it wouldn't be too stressful, but I'm curious to know, like if you were to design something for, for complete beginners, and I guess you kind of have, have what do you been. feel like is missing? What do you feel like is over-engineered? What do you feel like is um, overkill? Because the thing that's kept me stuck on this is uh, ironically <laughs> overthinking. Like, I'm like, the reason I haven't stepped into this market is because it's really easy to tell people what to do. It's really hard to see them succeed. Yeah. It's not hard to go, here are some modules. Here's a community, ask a question if you need it. It's really hard to get a lot of people over the line of success. So yeah. I'm curious to know how you would think about all this. Well, I've done this. So the experience, like, and, and I've kind of touched on this in the last hour or so, is that there is massive demand for it. You've proved that, right? You've got the wait list. People want it. You've engineered the the massive amounts of support and it's kind of like value. The, the problem that I've run into is that fragmentation of like the community mm -hmm. again, and I've mentioned that. And the other problem is like, as a, I create for myself and as a creator i love to make things and i've started this infiltration of like am i making this for a newbie and am i making this for someone who's established and am i making this for like a private client has been like has kind of blocked me yep. where, where as i said before i like just wanted to put it in one place and the third thing is that one of the superpowers that both you and i have is that I see our job as condensing time. <laughs> right. Like, right. I can give someone one singular insight that probably saves them years. You know, I, what if, if you do it this way, because I've done it this way, then I've just shortcut your inevitable success, by the way, because they were going to do it anyway. Mm. But I've just condensed it into three years. And when they don't have access to you, you rob them of that opportunity for that moment where they can just, where you can shortcut someone's life experience by weeks, months, years, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to do it. I know you're going to do it, but I'm, in, I'm super interested to see how much of the experience for you feels like going back to scaling a business again <laughs> and the Bro responsibilities scaling. of that. Yeah. You've just convinced yourself that because they're contractors and those things, it's not really growing a business. But those or, people or, or still aren't going to have a hell of a lot of access to you, right? I would also say um, I've convinced myself it's a noble cause that's worth any oh, addition. You're fighting the good fight, you know, you're swinging mm -hmm. your sword into the the forest of you know fake gurus and complexity and yeah, and all that. I'm just super curious to see how you feel when you're building layers between you and the people you care about. Yeah, hundred percent. And I've thought, I've and, thought a lot about you've this. Said, like I'm not going to be in the community and I, and those well, things, I'll, like, I'll be how, in the community. how are you going to manage that? Yeah. Yeah. So the way that I'm thinking about it is commu the community, my main offer is my close proximity thing. This is yeah. if, so what will happen when I release modern autonomy is I'm going to make the community no longer about new content. Like yeah. you guys have all the new content. You don't need new stuff. I'm going to share what's working for me now. And then we're going to pull a peep up. We're going to bring together a pool of people who will share what's working for them. And together we will find a thing that works for you. Right. As opposed to here's a new shiny thing. I'm, I'm really over that. 
especially with the people that I'm attracting into the community. Some dude at 1.5 million doesn't need a, here's how to post on YouTube, right? No. He needs a conversation. Yeah. And so I will continue to like raise the minimum standards of what it looks like to get into the community, 20K a month, 30K a month, and really make it about getting to 100K a month profit. And ironically, the guy at 1.5 million, that's his profit goal. Is he's like, when it's all said and done on the other side of burn it to the ground is I just want to make a million dollars a year profit or thereabouts. So it's, it's, a, it's amazing how much that uni that goal unifies. Yeah. Um, so no new content in the community, right? Really like simplifying that piece. It's more about proximity. I'll ratchet up the amount of access that people get to me in a way that I really enjoy. I love group calls. I love events. I'll actually do more events. Really fun for me. Um, I think we might do one all in workshop a month, both across modern autonomy and in um, the community. The thing that I'm trying to balance is this idea of proximity and being really closely connected to um, modern autonomy, this new membership is also a mirage in the sense of, I'm still thinking about it at a small scale. Like I think I could get this to, 300 members in 90 days. And then how do I work close proximity with any of them anyway? Because mm -hmm. if you have, if I run one group call a week, it's like, and 50 people are on there, it's like, no one's really getting help. And so I'm trying to figure out the best of both worlds, which is absolutely not delegating or abdicating it, but also giving everyone really close knit attention because I've been in massive programs before, especially in my early days where you're like, I, the person's right there, but I, I have to weave past a hundred people to get yeah, to them. Yeah, you know, yeah. You're on the group call and you, you put Q in the chat for your question. And then it's, you know, an hour, 45 minute later. And they're like, all right, that's all the time for the questions today. And you're like, damn. Whereas I know I can scale through other people. Like, I think this could be a model where we have hundreds of members and we have 12 support calls a week um, in every different time zone. And you can get your content reviewed and your offer reviewed and your setting reviewed. So all of it right now is very idealistic, but not, uh, it hasn't been poorly thought through. I've been thinking through it as much as I can, but then the next stage, and this is, I think one of the underrated things that you and I do is we, we test. So I will very publicly say you are going to get the most amazing experience and it might only be for 90 days. But if you come with me on this 90 day journey, you are going to get an experience for $297 a month. You have never gotten for $5,000, you know? And I think it, there's a, a beautiful side to that to me, which is I'm either going to test something. It's going to be amazing. And I might need to twist, tweak it and optimize it, or it's going to be terrible, but I'm still going to fulfill my word of making it awesome for 12 weeks. And then I'm going to blow it up and do it, go back to what I'm doing before. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that that's kind of the middle ground I'm finding myself. And I don't know if you have anything to add on that, but that's probably the only place I've got to, which is of I've, I've done all the brainstorming. I've sat with chat GPT and we've gone back and forth on a million different ways that, you know, beginners get help and, and ways that we can structure support. And this is kind of the best guess I have of what might be able to work. There, there, the things that are, the things that are guaranteed is that you will deliver a great experience for clients mm. from, cause you've got good people. You'll sell it cause you've got demand that, um, that there's a need in the market for it because there's so much bullshit, fake gurus, um, right. you know, like confusion, too many models, too many people following two different, too many different models. Like there's a need for it, et cetera. Yeah. The thing that I'm, and the other thing that will you do is that you will be prepared to change it, blow it up, reconfigure it as you go. Yeah. Which you know, that is not forever. So there should actually be nothing stopping you launching it because you can change your mind. Yeah. The thing that I'm fascinated about is how much of this will scale you away from the things you have now, which is that kind of intimacy and that connection. Yeah. How much you nap, you accidentally or naturally get back to an accidental bro scaler because oh, you've got, of course. You've, you've, you're going back to a model, which by nature can handle lots and lots and lots of people in it. I know, so dude. I'm and this is one of the things about how it fragments that and how it fragments your creation as well. Cause I've struggled with that a lot. Like I'm like, who's this for? I've got all these different clients at all these different levels and I've put them in these different places and it's really 100%. constrained the art. Yeah. Yeah. You and I are on exactly the same page, which is why I'm sitting with this feeling of going, I know I want to help people begin. I don't know the best way to package it because also Dude, but I put a hundred people in the 3K. 
Yeah. And now I'm changing my mind utterly on what the delivery is. Yeah. But that's good for them because I'm giving, I'm beginning, like, they're getting a lot more. Well, I this is, I think, worth delivery. talking about, at least just mentioning, which is that you get a you get away with a lot more when it comes to testing and tweaking and changing and evolving when people understand that you are for them, right? And especially yeah. on the client side, right? There's there's infinite tests and experiments and evolutions that you can make to delivery while still retaining clients without burning bridges when people understand, I really care about you. Your results yeah. really matter to me. Your best interests are at, at, at heart for me. And I'm just doing my best to try and figure out a way that we can make this both work for each other. And if you can be a little bit trusting, I'm going to do my best to try and find the thing that works for us both. Oh, people will give you unlimited leeway when you're upfront about that. Yeah. But when you say, I'm changing my thing to make it more scalable so I can sell more folks in and make more money. Of course. Like, they don't care about it. Like, you're robbing them of the things to, yeah. to, for your own benefit. But when 100%. you are actually searching for win-wins and efficiency and effectiveness and more places to turn up, then yeah. people will not only like be okay with change, they'll cheer you on and yeah. they'll want to make it better. Yeah, hundred percent. So we've been going for a while. Um, I'm starting to have kids run around me. I have apparently multiple families over right now. And I'm people, starving. I've um, run out of water. Yeah, I know. I've got I I got a bit of water. I did I did okay on the waterfront. I thought it'd be cool to do some rapid fire. Um yeah. one second, I've just got kids that are coming in. Hey Brooklyn, can you go out of the room, please? I'm just daddy's on a call. Yeah, I can see that. I got a mini re rebounder tramp. Um, hey boys, I'd like you to leave, please. That's so Tony Robbins. One moment, guys. Hey, Brooklyn. <laughs> I love it. Uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna keep all this in. By the way, people are getting the real deal. There's no editing on this video. Let's do rapid fire. What are some things that you've um, been using, reading, learning, like? And like, I'll, I'll start so you get what I'm talking about. I have uh, noticed in the last few months, I do stacks of work on my phone. Like, and when I say I do stacks of work, I mean, uh, I reply to Slack messages. I do my Zoom calls on my phone. Uh, I listen to, uh, when I listen to a podcast, it's on my phone, on a walk. But I noticed between work and con consumption and creation, because I spent a lot of time in the notes app, there were some days my uh, my screen time was like eight, nine, 10 hours. And again, it wasn't all work. I Almost none of it was work, but it was like thinking or writing or reading. So um, I don't know if you can see this. This is my phone background now. And it's just words on a screen. So I don't know if you can see that, but it's a shortcut menu. So you click music and it's like not really. Oh, zoom. You, click, you click music and then it goes to Spotify. And then you uh, go back here, you click Notion. So it's like basically like a minimalist thing. I wish I could tell everyone what the app is, but it's called something like blank. Uh, if I search blank, oh goodness, I'll need to find it and put it in the put it in the show notes. Put it in the really really random Dan and James when this uh, comes show notes. Out in 10 months. I don't know what it's called. I can show everyone what it looks like. It's that it's that one there with the line through it. I don't know if anyone can see that. Too blurry. Ugh, it's terrible. Way too blurry. It's a black. It's a black thing with a line in it. Basically, it okay. minimizes your uh, home home screen. The second thing, though, this has been the hack for me, is uh, I would go back and forth between having social media on my phone and not having social media on my phone. So um, I like posting stories, and so I'd be like, I would have a few weeks of no social media, and it'll be amazing. And then I'd be like, this is so stupid. I want to like post stuff occasionally when I'm out and about and then I'll get social media on my phone again and then I'll get lost into the abyss. So I got this app. You, you've you probably seen advertisements uh, from it. It's called Opal. Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah. It's been awesome. Really? So I'm allowed 30 minutes on Instagram a day. Yeah. And the first few days I would max it out every day. And now I'm like not even, cause like I go into Instagram now and it's like, I'm just firing through it real quick. I check my inbox. I'll go through a couple of stories. So I'm like, I understand I've got limited time. And then uh, a bunch of apps turn off at 8 PM and yeah. only reopen at 8 AM. And so I've had this for a few weeks. It's been awesome. So I just wanted to mention that as just something that like has been epic for me and reclaiming a lot of my uh, presence um, and then also, uh, this is a bit more nerdy. One second. I also got this huge 
uh, red light that's, panel. That's a huge one. It is big. Like that's that's how big it is. And so that's been the recent addition for meditation in the mornings. Um, alongside just getting sunlight, that's been great. Uh, and so meditating in front of that. And then um, I, I've, I'll be honest, I'm only here for like five weeks, but we are looking at buying a house in New Zealand. And so I have gotten a little bit overboard with buying stuff. Like I've got a kind of super 73 style e-bike arriving tomorrow. I've got a stu uh, Apple studio display, something screen coming. And then I ordered a cold plunge and <laughs> I've been going that's all part, out. That's part for the course with you. A hundred percent. Um, but the last thing I was going to say, and this is, uh, testing environment stuff, like really setting up your yeah. desk in such a way that, um, you're kind of in love with your office and things like that. I traveled basically all of March. I was in Japan twice and, uh, not having an office sucked. I don't know how people get work done at cafes and stuff like that. It's the worst. You just pretend to be busy and productive. So having an office again and engineering it down to plants and incense and what's on my desk and the natural light has just been amazing. So those have been a couple of things that have been on my mind and like yeah. really helping me kind of get stuff done. Yeah, yeah. Similar. Um, I've, I like, like a kind of a, a lot of people, I was like looking for content, like novelty. So mm -hmm. I started to listen to a lot of stuff and it was giving me too many ideas. Right. And so I've gone back to just rereading old books, either on the bookshelf, there's another bookshelf over here, or, and the other thing I started doing is taking my Kindle everywhere. Yeah. And then, so rather than being on my phone, because my screen time was creeping up just through boredom and doom scrolling, right. I took my Kindle and every time I had that dopamine, dopamine urge to get my phone out, I just pick my Kindle up and start reading. And that would like just soothe my brain. And it makes me infinitely happier. Yeah. But what are you? What kind of stuff are you reading? The only um, like old stuff. I read the choice again. That Goldfrapp book, um, like real dense, like reality transurfing again. Um, lots of um, red pill and kind of um, parenting content, which always gives me lots of ideas around coaching and like those kind of things. So it's all about frame and 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 those things. Um, the other thing was Twitter, like deleted Twitter off everything. Cause I was like doom scrolling something like I had to get rid of Twitter like, a while ago. There's some really smart people sharing really interesting things and some really dumb and, people sharing lots and of I really dumb like, things. I was convincing myself that lots of stuff was important that just wasn't. So it went from like deleting Twitter off this to deleting Twitter off my iPad and delete it. Cause I'd, re I'd be reading a book on here and I'd be like, I just have a quick just have a quick look and then be like, blah, 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 blah. like, so Twitter was like, Dude, you're seeing someone like crash a plane and then punch someone. And Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was like, convinced me that the world was falling apart, that, you know, every man was going to die lonely and every woman was like, you know, a miserable, you know, cat lady. It was just like, yeah, it's just like, Oh yeah. Bad. So it's actually a really just such an important note. Hey, eh? like I, find like what's crazy is the world is how it is regardless of whether we know about everything or not and there was a time in history when there was something happening on the other side of the world that you didn't know about and it didn't yeah. make your life any worse yeah. even though that was a very real thing that that person experienced or that country is facing and when i'm on twitter i feel like world war three is about to be started all the time and mm -hmm. every conspiracy theory i've ever considered to be true is definitely true and and the elites are out to get us and those things may be true right i don't know all i know is when i'm not on twitter i don't think about it and i'm just here and i'm just living my life and i'm just serving clients and I, and i think that's content in general i think like there's this feeling that we, there's something else that we should know about somewhere else and so we're always looking for it on the twitter news feed or the facebook news feed or the instagram news feed and like there's something so powerful about being like, there's just nowhere else to be and nothing else to know. <laughs> and oh, when yeah. you embrace that, it just life gets so much richer. And I think I feel a lot smarter. Like my IQ point, I definitely add at least one, one IQ point, you know? Yeah. If I slow down, I'm happier. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, life is around me. Yeah. It's not, you know, in a hundred or 280 characters or whatever it is out there. And there's something I'm missing out on. So that, 
you know, like for me, like cultivating presence isn't so much of, you know, like being a Zen, like, like it's just like, look around, life's good. You know, the things that are important are, are right here. Yeah. And that I think sometimes a lot of the time ignorance is bliss yeah. because there's a lot of people who convince us that we need to pay attention to everything and like that's their agenda. Yeah. A hundred percent, man. Well, this has been a joy. I yeah. have people upstairs uh, coming over for dinner. We have a, a Tuesday night crew that we used to meet with every week. It's four families um, here in the Mount in New Zealand. And we used to meet every single week before we moved in 2021. And now that we're back in New Zealand, it's Tuesday night. And so just, you know, old habits die hard. Eh? We're just, they're yeah, all man. back around and we're doing this back thing. in the routine, back in the old place. Appreciate you good. taking the time, man. This has been a good convo. I have to do it again soon. Love you. See ya.